remember, in the course of discussing movies, the host will spoil plots. You've been warned. Listen to their screams. Greetings, ghouls and creeps, and welcome to Listen to Their Screams, a horror podcast that feels like you're chatting with friends. I am one of your friends, Dave, and we are joined, as always, by our other friend, Ike. Ike, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I can't complain. I had a, had a boo bucket from McDonald's today, so I'm feeling pretty uh, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I get the boo bucket fever. I've already got three of the four. <laughs> I, I just need the white one, and plus I have the uh, the limited exclusive thing from uh, Burger King. They have a bucket this year that is only available in four metropolitan areas in the country, and one of them happens to be Charlotte. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, through through my hookups in Charlotte, I have one of those now, and they have a a Halloween crown, and I have one of those too. So I'm I'm pretty stoked. But, uh, Dave, Dave has a Burger King plug in, uh, <laughs> in Charlotte, I guess. <laughs> no, I just know somebody that lives in Charlotte, so they, they, they went and got it for me. It's funny. Yeah, yeah. I love Burger King. I saw, you, cause I saw you post on Facebook that you tried the new Ghost Pepper Whopper. How, how was that? Um, to, to be honest, um, I didn't try it. That was not mine. <laughs> oh, fair. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was someone else in the houses, but I told them – that before they ate it, I needed to take a picture of it for, you know, because that's what I do. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for marketing stuff. And uh, I did try the ghost pepper chicken fries, and those are pretty good. Cool. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't tried either yet. I'm looking forward to them now. Yeah. I do want to try the Whopper uh, soon, but uh, that wasn't my craving today. So you're like, I had to have the chicken fries. Yeah. The, they were pretty. They were pretty good. I like them. So. But uh, yeah, I, I like the boo bug, man. I like pe- seeing all the people that post online and stuff. Oh, it's just, it's fun. It's a, uh, and it's you know just another thing in the spooky season. And uh, by the way, they they've added that fourth one, that purple one, that's a vampire, and that one is uh, primo. That is beautiful. I love the purple vampire one. Uh, that is uh, that is my favorite of the the four this year. Yeah, that's the one that so, they gave us it down here. So uh, I was I was pretty yeah. stoked. Yeah, I like that one. So. Well, all right, moving on from uh, fast, <laughs> the fast food portion of the show. Uh, on today's episode, we are going to review the straight-to-streaming Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, and we're going to talk about that. Now, before we get to that, though, we have lots of stuff to discuss and talk about and everything else. Uh, so, Ike, uh, besides the uh, Bloodlines, um, what else did you watch this week? Um, yeah, we're, we, me and uh, me and Caleb have been going back through and watching a bunch of stuff. Um uh, we, so kind of a weird segue. I'll, I'll mention this last. Uh, so we've been watching a bunch of stuff. Uh, we rewatched, um, Casper for the one from like 1995, I think, uh, with uh, Christina Ritchie. It's on, uh, it's mm-hmm. on Netflix. It's very nostalgic for me. I used to watch it a lot as a kid. Um, I was, I was a young kid, mind you, because I, I was born in 95. So I was really young when it was on VHS. Um, and for people who maybe are listening to this that are younger than even, than even I, VHS is the little tapes they used to put in the player. Uh, <laughs> I kid. Um, and I always like the uh, most of the kids type movies like that and everything else with those those big clamshell, those big yes plastic clamshell ones. I love those. Th- those are the best, truly. Yeah, those um, are like uh, Disney movies and all that stuff. They were in those. So. Yeah, the little the, the what was it the Red Diamond like Disney mm-hmm. tapes and all that stuff, but. Good stuff. But yeah, so I watched Casper. Um, we watched some odds and ends. We watched Halloween, Scream, just some weird stuff. Um, but we also watched the first six episodes of the new Goosebumps television series yeah. uh, on Disney+. Plus. It was extremely good. Um, I, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, definitely a fresh take on some of the old Goosebumps. The old Goosebumps obviously has sort of like the campiness, you know what I mean? They're not great, but they're all right. Um but uh, yeah, we watched the new one really good, but we also rewatched some of the old ones to get some context for um, what the newer ones were about. But uh, in doing so, and this is kind of what I mentioned earlier, in doing so, I found a very weird pipeline from Goosebumps to a few other TV shows. So oh. for, for people who maybe don't know, Goosebumps was filmed in Canada. Most of it was filmed in Canada. 
Uh-oh. Um, so there is a lot of crossover between fucking Goosebumps, Supernatural, and a Canadian like sitcom, not a sitcom, but kind of a crime drama called Murdoch Mysteries. Mm-hmm. So there's like everybody who's ever been in Goosebumps has probably appeared either in Murdoch Mysteries or Supernatural as like a right. background character. <laughs> Are, are we talking about the new Goosebumps, the old Goosebumps, or the what? old Goosebumps? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, the old Goosebumps. And, yeah, and I, I see crazy. that all the time. I mean, all the time we'll be watching stuff, and I'll be like freezing, I'm like, oh, you know who that was? They played that so and so in that episode of Supernatural, and I see them all the time. And then when you start seeing multiples and stuff, you start saying, okay, yeah, this show was probably filmed in the Vancouver area, yeah, because that's that's where Supernatural was filmed, and Supernatural, you know, was notorious like lots of shows. They they reused a lot of actors. And, you know, actors appeared multiple episodes and some of them, they're hard to pick out, you know, because they completely change their look. But there's a there's a many actors and actresses that are in multiple episodes. But I do that all the time. I'll watch something and, and I'm all the time. Catch it. We just did it with. um, What did we? Oh, we we started to watch uh, Gen V. And we, we, we watched the first episode of Gen V, the uh, the boys uh, new series that's out on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And um, one of the main actresses in, in that show uh, was in a couple, two different episodes of Supernatural. And, um, that also in Gen V is, uh, the actor that played Jack in Supernatural. Now, this okay. all makes a lot of sense because the boys was developed for TV by Eric Kripke, who created Supernatural. So he, <laughs> he, he, he has his guys he likes. I mean, like, you know, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan's gonna be in, uh, the next season of The Boys. Of course, you know, Jensen Ackles was in The Boys. Um, um, uh, uh, shoot, Jim Beaver that played Bobby Singer was in The Boys. There's there's lots of people where it crosses over because, you know, producers, creators, directors, you know, when they it, it trickles down. When they do a show, they they have the people they like to work with. And they know we'll get the job done. And then you know they so they have certain directors and certain writers, and then those people have certain actors and and crew they like to work with. And it and it ends up you see a lot of that, right? I mean that's just the way it works. So uh, yeah. But I, again, I, I, all the time I'm spotting Supernatural because, I mean, I love Supernatural. And I've seen it so many times. All the time spotting people. <laughs> but I was not aware. So when when was this, the original Goosebumps out? It, it was pre-2000. Like, I think a majority of it was like 1993 to 98. So, okay. I mean. So some of the actors would have been quite a bit younger. Yeah, like we're talking like kids. A lot of the kids. They so I, so it's either one or the other. It's either these kids have like a lot of acting credits because they went on to act like in other TV shows and they eventually ended up in, like I said, Supernatural or Murdoch Mysteries or like this is their only credit. And it's oh, super yeah. weird. And, but like, I mean, it's just like how a lot of those kids actors were for Goosebumps. I mean, Goosebumps yeah. was very regional. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. it, it was a North America thing. It, it definitely wasn't super well known i mean across all of it i mean it may be now because it's very readily available you can watch pretty much any old goosebump episode on youtube but it yeah. was just sort of weird to see all that crossover with those other shows but i mean it's it's canada i mean <laughs> I, yeah. I don't imagine their acting pool is is that large <laughs> clearly not <laughs> yeah and and when you um there are laws i think in canada too when you film there's a certain percentage of like i think crew and actors and stuff that have to be canadian and or something like that but uh, yeah, it's it's wild how they do that. But like even like it's supernatural. Some of the early seasons, there's actors and actresses that played kids that are you know because the show ran 15 seasons, so 15 years, right. and then you'll see them in some of the later seasons back you know playing you know adults. <laughs> it, it's pretty crazy. I love it. But yeah, so that's pretty much all I watched, and I, I had a weird, kind of a weird like rabbit hole with the whole goosebumps thing and. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it was kind of an eventful week, I would say. I watched a lot of other stuff that I can't remember, um, you know. Yeah. But it was good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I watched I watched several things. Uh, one thing we both watched, we'll, we'll talk about that last. And uh, but oh, yeah. again, I, I watched the uh, the second episode of Chucky, uh, the, the series, which was it was good. I'm still enjoying that. Uh, and then I watched a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, new releases on you know Shutter and Screenbox this week. I watched uh, I watched the Puppet Man, which was not bad. It was pretty decent. Uh, I watched. <laughs> Heebie TV, which is a uh, very wacky, just as wacky and wild as it sounds. And, um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy, but it, it's, but it, it was fun too. It was pretty clever. Uh, I watched uh, shaky shivers, which I really, really liked. I, I highly advise everybody to watch it. It has a good mix of, of horror and comedy. Um, and it's, it, it's very clever and it's, it's a fun, fun movie. 
Um, and then I watched uh, well, I, and then I watched Hill House LLC. I started to watch because I haven't seen like the sequels. Mm-hmm. There's like three sequels I think and, that yeah. are like straight to Shutter, and uh, I've never seen any of those, and I haven't seen the first one in a while. So I rewatched the first one with the goal to watch the others. So I'm gonna watch my way through all those. And then the final thing we watched uh, was a, a a short film uh, that was sent to us. Uh, let me uh, I, I guess I should have been ready for this. Uh, that was sent to us uh, through Twitter X, whatever you want to call it, uh, by Vincent Stalba. He reached out to us uh, about a short film that he has that um, is called uh, Fucking Nuts. And uh, fucking is, you know, cleverly abbreviated F-C-K apostrophe N. And uh, he wanted to know that, you know, if we wanted to see it and wanted to, you know, told me some about it. It's been to several film fairs and different things like that and, and, and been pretty – it's been well-received. And uh, wanted to know if we would want to see it and perhaps, you know, do an interview or a, a review. And, uh, we, you know, we don't do we don't do interviews. We will at some point, I'm sure there will be somewhere we'll fit some in. But, you know, it's not something we do regularly. But uh, I did want to do kind of a just a brief review here. Not, you know, nothing super in depth. Uh, again, this was a short film. I think it was, what, 12 minutes, something like that. Yeah. And um, and uh, <laughs> it was. You know, this fucking nuts was it was it was it was fun. It was really entertaining. It, it, again, it was it was wacky, kind of wacky. Um, and um, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to really give spoilers on this because I really want people to seek this out and, and watch this uh, for some of the big twists. So we let's don't give away the big the big thing yeah. because <laughs> because there's there's a big a big plot point or the big whatever reveal moment in this. That literally, I I was laughing my ass off when I saw it because it's not what I expected, um, at all. I just I just didn't. I thought it was going another one direction, and it totally went another direction that would never cross my mind, never, not in a million years. And uh, so that was very very funny, and uh, and and gave it kind of a a, a real unique twist at the end that was kind of fun. Uh, again, this is very this thing is very tongue in cheek, very it's meant to be comical. Uh, but it does, you know, it does have horror elements, does have some, you know, some of that campy, you know, in a campy horror way. Um, but it was well shot, well acted, well done and produced for especially for a 12 minute short. Um, and it's 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 really, really it's it was a good time. I liked it. You know, it's uh, I, I like how they, they knew they knew their lane with this. Right. This is not something you could develop into a full full length feature. There wasn't enough meat there to it. But for a little 12 minute short, it was it was perfect. And it was a fun a fun watch. I could see something like this, you know, popping up or, or something similar to this being in a, like an anthology type thing somewhere, you know, and it's what it felt like. Uh, but but I thought it was a good time and, and I thought it was fun. Uh, I, what, what did you think of fucking nuts? Oh, I, I fucking love fucking nuts. Let me tell you what. You um, <laughs> I was good. It was good. So like you said, without uh, without giving any, you know, major spoilers, um, the the movie obviously has sort of like a climax slash uh, big reveal. Um, and like you said, no spoiler, because like you said, I do really want people to see this on their own. This is definitely something you need to experience without having it spoiled. I want to give them a bunch of kudos, but the big ones that I want to give them is first and foremost, the sound for this, the music. Yeah. Oh, so good. I love that kind of style of music, like that sort of ethereal um, kind of throwback esque music because it, it's clear that they're trying to kind of make it seem like these, you know, they're kind of from the maybe the eighties ish, maybe earlier, um, just kind of based on how they were dressed. And you know, it, it it was just the music was really good, and for what it was, it actually built tension very well. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily scary, but it it, it did a very good job of setting the scene, setting the mood. And building tension. Obviously, this seemed sort of like a prototype film. So maybe just to kind of, you know, get some ideas on paper, maybe. Maybe get them to, um, you know, get some meat before they, you know, really try and bite down on something. But um, I think that it, I think that there's a lot of promise with these filmmakers. I mean, obviously, I'm just some, you know, some fucking nobody who lives in middle nowhere, Florida or whatever. So obviously, take this with a grain of salt. But um, in terms of like film elements, this had a lot of really good technical stuff that I feel like you don't get in a lot of major motion pictures nowadays. Um, and, and even though it's only a 12 minute short film, they, they fit plenty in that 12 minute short film to make it feel full. So, 
Um, definitely, if you have a chance to check it out, uh, I would. I would love to see this like in an anthology, like you said, somewhere. Um, or, you know, I, I, I do want to see more from these creators because it's just they, they do they do very well with what they have. And I think it was it was really good for what it was. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and, I, and I was looking up just some details on this. Uh, Vincent Salva, who reached out to me, uh, plays plays Dan, the main guy in the in the <laughs> in the short. And um, and uh, and he may have I mean, I'm not sure I, I, you know, I haven't super dove into this. He may have some hand in the uh, in the producing side of it or the writing side, too. I'm, I'm assuming there's probably guys, you know, people that did multiple jobs on this, uh, you know, being a, a little independent short. Right. Uh, and from what I'm seeing, it does not look like it's a uh, it's available for public consumption just yet because they're still doing lots and lots of showings at film fests, uh, conventions, uh, different things like that. It, it's uh, as I've scrolled through his his feed, they're they're out there doing all kinds of showings. I mean, just it's, it seems like on a weekly basis they're showing this thing somewhere else. So it's still very active out there and they're pushing it. Um, you know, I could see this thing completely getting picked up by one of the, the horror streaming services. And, uh, you know, being and put on one of their on their services. Um, but it's a fun watch. So um, keep an eye out for that. Again, it's 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 fucking nuts. Uh, FCK apostrophe in nuts. Uh, if you want to follow Vincent, he's uh, you can go on X or Twitter or whatever they're calling it these days uh, <laughs> at, at Vincent underscore Stalba, S-T-A-L-B-A. And uh, if you make contact with him or anything else, or speak to him, just just tell him that we sent you and uh, tell him that we you know, we appreciated his film. Uh, I'm sure he will be checking this out. He was very curious to see what we thought of it. Uh, so I, uh, let's go ahead and let's, let's, let's give a rating to it. Um, again, this is kind of unique. We've never done a short like this. And, um, so it, it's, it's like we don't have a lot to compare it to, right? Cause you can't really compare it to a full length film per se, because it's a different, it's a different beast. But if we use kind of our standard judgment process of, you know, three being middle of the ground, uh, you know, we enjoyed it, but it was, yeah, nothing bad, nothing great, but it was enjoyable. Um, I really, I, I really think I have to give this just a notch above, and I think I have to give this a three and a half because this was really, really fun. Uh, it, it like, like we both said, it, it knew what it had to do, right? It, it, it got in, did a lot in 12 minutes, kept your interest, and then, and bam, hit you with something and got out. It didn't, you know, it didn't do anything. To, to, to ruin the mood, to ruin the, the, the feel of it. Um, and it was just, it was just, it felt, it just felt perfect, right? It felt like it fit right where it should. Uh, didn't, didn't leave you thinking, well, there's, you know, that, that was about four minutes too long. Um, and it didn't really make you feel like, oh, you needed, you know, should have told more. It, it just felt like it was right where it needed to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think typically it would be around a three, really enjoyable. But that the reveal just got me so so much. It just cracked me up. It was so 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 funny that I think it's gonna bump it up a five, another half a, a point for me. Gotcha. You know, normally I would probably agree with you three and a half out of five. Um, but I don't know. I, this movie, this little short film, it really is. I because I watched it multiple times. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I really enjoyed it the first time, so I watched it a couple more times. Um, and you know, and I just honestly, I think that. All of the elements put together, um, they made it very short and concise. You know, the the acting was actually solid in my opinion. You know what I mean? Better than some of the horror acting that we see today. Um, and and just the sound and the audio and the music was so good. Um, I think I would have to put this up at a four in terms of a short film. I think this would give this would strike me as a four. Um, you know, I guess like I said, normally I would have probably agree with three and a half, but I, I think I'm gonna have to go just a step further just because honestly, the music really hooked me. It, I hearing that music just like scratches an itch in my brain for some reason. Mm-hmm. So, uh, four, four out of five for me. There you go. Then a consensus three and three quarters for fucking nuts. Again, whenever, <laughs> however, it, this gets put out there, or if you have a chance to see it at a, a you know, a film fest or, or something like that, go do it. It's, it's a good time. It's fun. Yeah. And, uh, like you said, I, I look forward to, to seeing more from these creators. So, uh, there you go. That's our, that's our opening. And it's time then for our weekly segment. Stump the Co-Host. And this week, we are playing Stump the Co-Host. That is our trivia game that Ike and I compete with. Uh, We each draw two cards out of the exact same. uh, We both have the exact same four trivia deck. We each draw two cards, which is four questions. There's two questions per card. And we alternate asking each other questions. 
uh, and then see who wins uh, this round. And then at the end of the year, we will proclaim uh, the uh, the show trivia champ, which uh, as it stands right now, uh, Ike is leading with three wins, no losses, and three draws. So uh, my my hole's getting deeper. There's only so many. You know, we don't do this every week, so there's only going to be so many rounds of this left. So to make this thing interesting, I, I got to put a run on here and, and tie this thing up quick, and uh, you know try to send this thing uh, down to the wire. We'll see what happens. So, Ike, do you have your cards ready? I surely do. All right. Since uh, hey, you, since since I'm since I'm fighting from the cellar here, I, I'm going to make the choice here, and and I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose to go first this time. I think I typically put you on the spot, but I, I'm going to see if I can't uh, put you on the defensive here, and and I'll take the first question. Sounds like a plan. Your first question is the 1972 version of The Last House on the Left was the directorial debut for which director? Oh, I want to say it was Wes Craven. That is correct. I actually tried to make that more uh, cliffhanger than it is. I knew it was Wes Craven. Wes Craven. <laughs> All right, good deal. Whew, jumped out there. Let's see what happens. Here is your – oh, man. Uh, we'll see. This is – I'm not sure. This is in your time period here. What 2014 movie involves a story of two siblings battling a supernatural mirror? Oh, uh, that's, uh, oh, shit. O is that Oculus? That is Oculus, correct. Okay, so now I'm back to square one here. Here we go. <laughs> All right, break right. on. Question two for me. Numero dos. We have this Twilight Zone-esque Netflix series taps into our collective unease with our modern world and the dangers of advanced technology. Hmm. It's a Netflix series. It kind of has the uh, anthology-esque feel of Twilight Zone, where each episode is, a little, it has, is basically different, uh, but it's on Netflix. I, I feel like I'm going to know this, but uh, for some reason... Ooh, I don't know. For some reason, I'm just shooting a blank. What is it? It is Black Mirror. Ah, yes. Crap. Well, now here we are again. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, ooh, wrong card. Here we go. Your second question. What are the three simple rules for taking care of a mogwai that must never be broken in the movie Gremlins? Oh, man. So, obviously, you don't, don't feed them after midnight. That is one, correct. Um, don't get them wet. That is two, correct. And uh, no bright lights, is that right? That is correct. Okay. <laughs> Man, I had to push for that Gremlins watch a few <laughs> months back. Ah, oh, boy. Here we are. Now I'm, now I'm battling from behind again. <laughs> Come on, I can do this. Question three, go ahead. All right. Which actress plays a psychotherapist who enters the mind of a comatose serial killer in the 2000 film The Cell? Uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen this movie. My knowledge, uh, let me guess. I'll just shoot a shot and say, uh, what the fuck? Jodie Foster. No, it is Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> oh, my God. That's why I haven't seen that movie. Fair. <laughs> Not a J-Lo fan. Not a J-Lo fan. Oh, boy. Here we go. What is Norman Bates' hobby in the movie Psycho? Um, He likes to... Honestly, I don't remember. Um, Does he like to... Uh, what is it? I don't know what it's called, but like when you stuff animals. Yes. Yeah, it's taxidermy. Okay. Taxidermy. <laughs> Damn it. So, see, I've already lost this. God! I started so well, too. All right, okay. go ahead, give me my fourth question. It doesn't matter, but let's bring it on. You'll get this one. What is the name of the sequel to Ridley Scott's Alien? Uh, Aliens. That is correct. Damn it, why can't I get more questions like that? <laughs> get fucking questions about J-Lo movies. <laughs> I was, I've never heard of that movie, so I don't, I, I, don't, I don't blame you on that one. I would have gotten that one wrong. Do I look like I'm a fan of Jenny from the Block? No, I'm not. I'm still, I'm still Jenny. For, oh, I better not sing that. That might be copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want the J-Lo hate coming down on us. 
She'll, I was send, just saying. she'll send Ben Affleck to get us. Hey, I'll talk to Ben Affleck. I like Ben Affleck. Me too. <laughs> Baffleck. Talk, let's, let's talk some Phantoms, baby. That's right. I love Phantoms. Good. It's been Me too. I haven't seen that in a while. Like, like they say in uh, whichever Kevin Smith movie is, yo, Phantoms is the bomb, yo. <laughs> All right. What TV show remake is based on a 1985 movie starring Michael J. Fox as a high school basketball player? Um, that's uh, it's, he's, he's a wolf. Um, Teen Wolf is a, isn't it? Yes, that is Teen Wolf. God dang it! See, I would have got that one. Even though I've never watched the show, but <laughs> I've watched. You're like, I, you're like I know Michael J. Fox. <laughs> I know that movie. Oh well, so you won again. I don't know why we play this game. <laughs> Let's take a break because, you know, I got to cower in the corner. And when we come back, we'll have something that's going to perk me up. We'll have news and birthdays and anniversaries and all that fun stuff. So stick around. Make sure you subscribe to listen to their screams on your favorite podcast platform. Also, make sure you look us up on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, TikTok, and Slasher. All you have to do is look up Listen to Screams. That is Listen, the number two in Screams, and you can find us there. Also, make sure you go and buy yourself a Listen to Their Screams t-shirt. You can find all of our shirts at tinyurl.com Screams Shirts. Spread the news. Spread the news. Spread the news. And we are back with the news. You heard that right. And starting us off at the top, a very, very, very cool thing that just happened. We have Saw, the Jigsaw Trials, a tabletop game, is has come, and it is on the Kickstarter Um now, you're, Dave, you're gonna have to remind me. Uh, what is what is the Kickstarter? What is the company's name that's doing this? Um, I don't know. I will, uh, <laughs> <laughs> give me a, give me a moment. You well, while he does, yeah, while he does that, there, this Kickstarter because I already forgot the name of the company. I apologize, but the Kickstarter for this game is going to be live on October 31st. That's right. At the end of October, we're gonna have a Kickstarter for a Jigsaw Trials tabletop game. So. Dave's going to get this information for us on who it is, but we will have the link uh, in the show notes and the description and whatnot. Um, so you guys will be able to actually click it and figure it out yourself. So feel free to look it up. It is uh, it is made by Iconic Studios. That is I-C-O-N-I-Q Studios, the designer of the upcoming officially licensed tabletop game based on the Saw film franchise. There you go. But this is going to be called, again, Saw, the Jigsaw Trials. This tabletop game is a two to six player competitive game where players combine cards to build traps and set them against other players. It has a jigsaw damage system where you swap out limbs as they take damage. The game is won when only one of you is left alive. Now, when you uh, there is a whole trailer for this that has a lot of information, too. Uh, But one of the cool aspects of this game, too, is that the premise is that you are a candidate to become basically the next jigsaw. Um, so you have to create traps, but you also have to survive traps. Um, so it's basically creating the best of both worlds. Um, you get to be Jigsaw, but you also get to survive Jigsaw. So uh, very cool, very awesome, very excited for this. Um, you know, definitely, um, if you can, you know, support the Kickstarter. Um, I'm a huge fan of Saw, so obviously I'm going to tell you to support it. <laughs> yeah, and it's pretty cool because there's, uh, there's you know, cards for the characters, whichever character you play. But the cards are not – they're very unique as in they're, – they're, they're puzzles, essentially. And when uh, you're in traps and things are going on and you get hurt, you can switch out body the body parts on the pieces. So you start whole, and then if you get, like, something that happens to your left arm, you remove the piece that's the left arm, put in the next piece, which shows it hurt, injured. And then if it does again, you can remove it and put in the piece where, like, maybe the left arm is missing. And that it interchanges. So your card that, that shows – depicts your character – uh, actually, you know, you switch out the stuff so that you can see where you are visually and, and have a visual context, kind of like you're, you know, kind of like you're watching the movie, right? As things develop and things happen to the characters, you can see it there unfold as you switch out the pieces. And it, so it's, it's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty clever. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's very simple, a very simple concept, just a little, you know, 
whatever it is, five, five, six piece puzzle. Essentially, yeah. is all it is. And that's, uh, you know, it's very unique. I, that's pretty cool. Uh, but there's different things, you know, that you can hit. There's specialty cards. Um, but in all that, it, it talks about it in the trailer. Uh, not only in the, the show notes will we have a link to the Kickstarter, but we'll also have a link to the trailer so that, that if people, you know, if it's perked their interest, they can go watch that. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but I'm super stoked for it. So uh, we'll let you guys know if we hear any other updates or news about it. Uh, but there you go. So strong start. And we're going to keep going strong because we have some other cool news for you. Um, we actually tweeted about it, but Miramax, well, I guess it's not called tweeting anymore, but anyways, Miramax has acquired what the What do you rights. call it? Xing? I yeah, I guess so. I mean, what awesome. is this? Well, they, they, I'm sure they have a name for it, but uh, posting, I guess it's just posting. I don't know. It's Twitter. I'm sorry, Elon. Actually, I'm not sorry, but uh, <laughs> go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, this was this was gigantic news. This is This is news that we couldn't sit on until the show. We had to put this out there immediately. Uh, and yeah. we'll talk about this because it was really wild. It's really it was a unique day. So go ahead and finish out and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Absolutely. Um, but there was a little bit of back and forth. But Miramax has acquired the rights to the Halloween tr- franchise. And that does include TV rights. And there is discussion of a series. There was a poll that we held on Twitter. And we asked if you were excited about the franchise expanding to include a series. Um, now, 59 percent of you said no. Forty one percent of you said yes. Um, but here's the thing. Just based on sort of where we're going with this and what's kind of been announced, I think Halloween would greatly benefit from a reboot, and I think it would greatly benefit from a TV show. I think that it should – basically, we need to start over. You know what I mean? We've closed out the original Jamie Lee Curtis timeline, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that's done. That's over with. I love Jamie Lee, but she's not going to be, you know, she's not going to be the character anymore. She, that's not her. Yeah. So, um, you know, basically, I think at this point, I think, you know, a lot of people are going to, again, get kind of hung up on the nostalgia of it. But I think it's really important to remember that these franchises are they're made to last. They're made to be, you know, proliferated into oblivion. So um, I think it'll be good. I think a TV show is what it needs, quite frankly. Yeah, I think we I think we actually talked about this a ways back on an episode. I don't know how we got into it or got to maybe it was during one of our Halloween, uh, the, the 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 recent films, uh, maybe Halloween or something. I don't know what it was, but we I think we discussed that uh, Halloween I think would work for a series. Yeah. And I, I I think from what I'm seeing online, a lot of people's trepidation is I think they really wanted to see it get away from Miramax. And I think there, so I see all kinds of people saying, oh well, we're gonna have another Halloween resurrection. We're gonna have the and that's what they think is going to happen in 20, you know, the 2020s. And it's not because it's a different, it's different, right? It's different now. And, um, and, and I think, I just think a series would be a breath of fresh air and it could be something they could do. Um, I think you're right. I think they need to close out. I would love, and it, it, it won't happen. And I know some people will instantly scoff at what I say, but I wish they would actually kind of somehow dip back into the cold of thorn stuff. I know those are some of the movies that when we we're going to rank next week, yeah. that they're, they're not going to rank super high for me, probably overall, some of them. But I think there's some meat there that in modern times that they had the right writers could do something fun and creative with it that would allow them to do something outside the Laurie Strode stuff. And um, I'm not saying it has to be exactly what it was before, but I'm saying I'm saying there could be some of that in there. They could, you know, they could, uh, if they did a series, they could pull in some elements from Halloween 3 and, and things that don't really fit neatly in with the Michael Myers timeline. And they could, they could pull that in and, and, and tie it all together and make this universe. Um, people are so hung up looking back and, and getting hung up that, oh, I, I hated resurrection and I hated these, this part and this part and what I, what it became. And this is all, we're just going to get more. I, you know, I don't, will you? I mean, it's, it's different now. And I, I really think everybody, whatever franchise it is and whatever movie it is, whatever is being put out there, particularly by big studios, they're all, they all understand. You can't just throw something out there and, and it, it be okay. They're seeing these mega hits for the context of horror that's, that's out there, you know, smile. And, 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 and all these other movies that are huge at, at the box office. I mean, we talk about it all the time. Now, horror is consistently 
you know, leading on their opening weekends at box office. But you can also see movies, you know, like Exorcist Believer, which underachieved from what they hoped, even though right. it, it, it did OK, but it not wasn't what they wanted. And some of these type things. So they know that, hey, you can't just ride on that name. It's not like the 80s and 90s where they, oh, we just put Michael Myers in it, put Halloween on it. It'll be good. It'll it'll sell. People will come see. It. Well, there's a lot more competition for viewing now, and a lot more competition in the theater. So I I, I mean I think no matter who won the rights, I, I think there's going to be a little more care put into it, right? There's going to be some context, and you're going to have people attached to it who are who are invested because most of them probably grew up loving these movies. So yeah. um, now there was it was a wild day because there was lots of people reporting. That A24 had locked up the, the rights. Yeah. Uh, so much so that we put a thing out saying that too, but we did say, hey, this is not confirmed. No official source has, has put this out there. Uh, so, you know, take it for what it is, but there are lots of people saying it. There were so many people that you felt like it could have just been somebody BSing and it caught wind because it, it, it happened too quick by too many people. Uh, and I, I, some, a lot of people that I don't think would just, purely pick up something and and everybody believes that hey you know a24 was there and they they pretty much had it and then miramax swept in at the last minute and kind of whatever outbid or, or whatever they had to do uh, so you know while it would have been curious to see what a24 would have done with it again i don't i don't know you know it, it's going to be okay and uh let's just let's don't prejudge and predetermine something yeah. that's not even begun to be <laughs> you know, not even to begin to be written yet or anything. Let's let's see what they put out there. Before we... like, this motherfucker's not even in pre-production. Like, <laughs> yeah, let's 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 see and let's just be hopeful, right? Let's let's yeah. be be thankful that you know there's something, some more coming, something new coming. Um, you know, and I, I hear everybody say, oh, it needs a little break. Well, there's don't be a little break. It's not like they signed a deal and they're gonna churn a movie out by spring. It's, you know, there'll be, there'll be a gap here where, you know, it'll happen. And I'm telling you, I, I don't know. I, I like the series ideal. I really think this is horror series have shown what they can do. And I, you know, I think it's time for these big franchises who have a dozen movies already under the belt to try something different. And then let's see how that works, right? You can, I mean, essentially, what do you, you know, if you have a 10 episode series, it's essentially, it's like one movie broke into 10 parts. So it's not like it's that different. I don't know. People, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I just, I, I think horror series are, they're really working right now. And they're yeah. really, they're really, it's a, it's a, a nice thing. And it's, they're being well done and there's streaming services for this stuff. And it's, it's cool. Let's see one of these, you know, we're going to get the Crystal Lake thing and, Let's see these big franchises try it too, right? We let's let's see what it's like and see what they can do with it because that's exciting to me to see them try something different and see see what it is. Yeah, no, absolutely, I, I totally agree, and I think it's like you said. I think the big thing is is you know let's just wait and see, see how it happens, and if it's bad, we'll talk about it. <laughs> that's yeah. that's all we can that's all you can do, but. Uh, all right, we're gonna move on from Halloween for right now, but just be, just keep in mind, we will come back to it uh, literally next week because we're mm -hmm. doing our franchise review next week. But also, this is gonna be an ongoing thing. There's gonna be more news about it, so you'll you'll hear more about it very soon, I'm sure. <laughs> yep. But all right, moving on. The first teaser trailer for Stream was released. So this movie is uh, coming from the producers and the team behind Terrifier 2, and it will star Daniel Harris. Jeffrey Combs, D. Wallace, Tony Todd, David Howard Thornton, Daniel Roebuck, Melissa Rose, and more. There's no release date for this movie, but the trailer is out. And boy, oh boy, is that a is that a cacophony of uh, B movie glory in that cast list? <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty pretty. Funny. I, this is a movie I've been anticipating, and uh, you know they 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 put pictures out and stuff, and it's like, oh, give us something, give us something. And now they put this teaser trailer there and I saw it and it's like, oh man, this looks so fun. And I, I'm super, I'm super psyched. I can't wait till they announce a date and put out some more trailers and, uh, you know, see how it's going to be released. Uh, I, I kind of assume it's going to, I don't know. I, I my, my gut says it'll be a straight to screen box type thing. Yeah. Because the, uh, the, the producers behind Terrifier do have a working relationship 
with them. So I, I see that, you know, being it. Absolutely nothing. No, no reason to think that other than just past history and a gut, a uh, gut feeling. But whatever the case may be, I'm super stoked for this movie. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm stoked as well. Obviously, love anything from the creators uh, behind Terrifier. Can't beat that. Uh, and then uh, in very quick fashion, it was announced that the next VHS movie will be coming in 2024. You heard that right. Next year, we will have a new VHS film and it will feature found footage sci fi segments. Um, you know, we love we love a found footage movie. We love VHS. There are very few found footage uh, sci-fi movies that are like Aliens or anything like that that I can think of. Um, maybe Fourth Kind is kind of a found footage-esque movie. Um, and there's another one. I can't remember what it's called, though. But there is another one that I, I remember it being pretty good. But in any case, it's kind of an unused genre. Uh, but it is not an unused genre for VHS. VHS has uh, broached the sci-fi territory a few times in the past. Um, so this will be no different, and I think it'll be very good. Yeah, um, I wish they kind of kept with the year thing, but you know, there's still going to be a theme to it, so I think it'll still it'll still be okay. It'll still work. I'll still enjoy it. Uh, but I don't know what you're saying because I I really feel like uh you know found alien found footage could have just really been the original because you know back in the 80s or whatever they they tried to sell us on the alien autopsy uh, footage that you know and they put it out there. <laughs> Hosted by, you know, yeah, uh, Captain Riker from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation and all that and whatever. And, uh, you know, try to sell it to us that it was real. And, yeah, so j- I joke. I joke. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Uh, but, yeah, it'll be good. I think I think that this will hopefully they will stick with the years. Maybe they'll go back to like the 60s or something and it'd be kind of like a Roswell thing. Who knows? But uh, all right. Moving on. The movie Zombie Plane has been announced featuring. uh Wow. Vanilla Ice and Chuck Norris mm-hmm. playing themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, it is described as celebrities team up to contain a contagion on a flight before the plane is shot out of the sky. Um, OK, I mean, cool. I don't know what to say about this other than OK. Um, I, I don't have high hopes for it. I'll tell you that much. No, um, but no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm sure this is a wacky ass going to be a wacky ass bad movie. But when I saw this. You know, a movie that has Vanilla Ice and Chuck Norris. I'm like, oh yeah, we gotta we gotta report that. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, it uh, it'll be fun if for no other reason to see that. So yeah, that's that, that that's all you can say. It, it'll be fun. We'll we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see how it goes, man. Uh, Chuck Norris. I haven't heard that name in forever. I feel like he's probably what in his 80s now, and he's still doing like I, yeah, probably. movies and stuff. All right. Anywho. Piper Laurie, who played the mother in Carrie, also starred in many other films, uh, did unfortunately pass away a few days ago on the 14th at the age of 91. So um, obviously, you know, the original Carrie, which uh, I'm assuming that this is from with Sissy Spacek, was a uh, an iconic horror film of that time. It's also a Stephen King film. And, um, you know, it, it's obviously it's it's has a lot of, I would say, um, generational impact because I feel like every like 10, 15, 20 years, so they make a new one. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carrie is one of the first and greatest of those Stephen King movies and uh, definitely will be missed. Um, you know, a member of the community nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she also got, had a lot of acclaim in a movie called The Hustler with Paul Newman. It's not a horror movie, but it was a big, big movie. I think in the seventies, but, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's a big deal. So, uh, you know, whatever Godspeed. That's right. And then, uh, on the, on the converse there, we have some upcoming birthdays. Uh, we, these are some pretty big ones. I think I remember some of these from last year. Um, but as we say, October apparently is the, is the right time for movie releases and apparently birthdays. Um, so October 20th, 1882, we have the original Dracula, Bela Lugosi. Um, obviously we've sung the praises of the original, uh, monster films and Dracula is no, di- you know, it's, it is no exception to that rule. Uh, Bela Lugosi is obviously iconic and legendary. Uh, I know Dave, he loves Dracula. <laughs> yep, I do. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, like you said, we've talked about it enough. I don't, you know, I don't need to go any further, but. Uh, it, it is does bear repeating that you know when people think vampire, they envision some form close to Bela Lugosi. Uh, his his look in the movie with the cape 
and the little pendant, you know, the, the, the iron cross pendant and the slick back hair with the whatever they call that, the widow's peak thing or whatever it's called in the front and the and that stare and, and blah, blah, blah. That That's all Bela Lugosi. So that is, you know, he not just him, but the, the whole film and everything uh, pretty much laid the foundation for. The, the public perception of vampires overall <laughs> for, you know, over 100 years. Yeah. Or almost 100 years. <laughs> almost 100 years. We're almost there. Yeah. Uh, but very much so. Very much so. And then uh, on October 21st, 1956, uh, we have Carrie Fisher, uh, who, of course, we all know from Star Wars, but was also in Screen 3 for a, a little little cheeky cameo. Um, love love Carrie Fisher, obviously. We, we lost her a, a few years ago, but um, iconic nonetheless. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like she was in Scream 3, so, you know, there is that reason to mention her, but I, I'm, I'm big enough Star Wars fan that I would have mentioned her anyway. Just because there's 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 certain people that that transcend to that next level of hey you know you gotta say something no matter what so absolutely and then on October twenty second nineteen fifty two we have Jeff Goldblum Jeff Goldblum of course from such amazing movies as the Jurassic Park films uh, in the Fly um, Jurassic Park I feel like is an underrated but I would definitely call it a horror film um, I feel like a lot of people just consider it like a dinosaur movie but I would put the original in the category at least of a thriller. Um, it, it, it can be pretty scary if you kind of think of the implications. It, yeah, I mean, it's it's a monster movie. Yes, yeah. it's what it is. It's a monster movie. I mean, that that scene with the T Rex and them and that you know the kids and and Alan Grant and Jeff Goldblum in that car, um, or whatever it is, you know the one the one vehicle and it gets flipped over and pressed into the mud and then knocked off the li- that whole scene is it's that is suspenseful and terrifying, and um, it is it's just a monster movie. You know, yeah. take out. You know, these are, re, you know, regenerated dinosaurs, but you can take out a dinosaur and put whatever you want, or Godzilla or whatever, and it's the same concept, so. Absolutely. Love it. Love love dinosaurs, love monsters, love Jeff Goldblum. Uh, <laughs> on October 23rd in 1959, we have Sam Raimi, the director of the Evil Dead series. Sam Raimi's obviously done other stuff. That's such a Spider-Man, and uh, uh, he also did the uh, Multiverse of Madness. Uh, Sam Raimi is uh, iconic in so many ways, um, obviously fantastic with the Evil Dead series. So uh, we, we obviously love we love some Sam Raimi up in here. Yes, I do. I love I love all the Raimis. They're all great. Uh, you, you, know, it, you know, his brother Ted was great, too. I always like seeing him again. Another guy that was in an episode of Supernatural. Uh, but it's a I, I like all the Raimis. They're all fun. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's wild. Sam Raimi, you know, from going from a. Whatever, creating a, a little whatever student film with Bruce Campbell, uh, you know, a student short that evolved into the Evil Dead movies. To you know, I mean, the guy ended up directing the the Spider Man, the one Spider Man trilogy, which was freaking monstrous, and, and, you know, successes. And it's it's wild <laughs> how these uh how these things happen. Yeah, it, it is truly it is truly fascinating to to see you know him go from like you said literally. A, a, a student film and that, that turned into the evil dead, which the evil dead in of itself has become a wildly successful, um, you know, concept and you mm-hmm. know, series. But it, like you said, he, he literally directed freaking Spider-Man and then, uh, and then literally a, a Dr. Strange movie and probably one of the uh, most popular franchises of all time in the Marvel series. So yep. um, I digress. Uh, Sam Raimi's a legend. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then on October 24th, 1957, we have, uh, hopefully I pronounced this the right, John Cassier, um, mm-hmm. who is the voice of the Crypt Keeper. So, um, yep. very cool, very cool. I did not know who that guy's name, unfortunately, but uh, it is good to know. Yep, love the, love the Crypt Keeper. I have his uh, huge Tales from the Crypt guy. I uh, love that series. And, yep, he, uh, as far as I know, he is always the guy that does the voice of the Crypt Keeper. I don't think there's been... There was a short-lived animated series about the Crypt Keeper and Tales from the Crypt, and uh, I'm not 100% sure if he did the voice of that, but I am assuming he does because he does primarily voice – it is a primarily a voice actor. He does has done some other stuff. but So I, I, I believe if there's been anything with the Crypt Keeper talking, he has done it. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Upcoming movie anniversaries. So if you guys want something else to watch, you know, here, here are some anniversary movies that you might want to check out. 
October 19, 2007, we have 30 Days of Night. Uh, 30 Days of Night, uh, I, I love 30 Days of Night. It's definitely sort of a, a, a departure from your standard vampire movie. Um, and it's really good. I mean, it, it's a solid movie. The sequel, not so much, but the first one's good. I, I really like it. Yeah, it's it's very unique to, to think of that, uh, the concept of, you know, how you get, you know, some 30 Days of Night and, you know, in, in the whatever the north, whatever you call it, the northwest, Alaska and all that area. And uh, it's pretty cool to think of that. The vampires in that area, what's, what would you do? You know, because, you know, the, sticking to the folk tales, you know, that vampires don't come out in the sun and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah, definitely something to keep in mind if you live in Alaska, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, October 21st, 1988, we have Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Um, now, Halloween 4, of course, is the uh, sort of the first step in the Mark of the Curse of Thorn series, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Um, just because after Season of the Witch, um, you know, they, they, they kind of departed away from the uh, anthology series and they started saying, OK, let's start looking at the Curse of Thorn. And that's sort of what four, five and six um, establishes and then kind of follows through on. So Halloween 4. You know, I like it. I like all the Halloween movies to some respect, uh, some more than others, as we will find out next week. Uh, yep. But uh, I love it. The good stuff. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, I, I love the I love the Halloween franchise. It's one of those. those me and Monica had that these discussions all the time of why we have favorite horror movies, right? And, and favorite films in these series. We always have the, a discussion that we, we always seem to come back to is, you know, which iconic series has is best overall. The overall quality of movies from start to finish, if you take them all into account, right, and you can't put any of them away. And, um, you know, and, and Halloween's up there for me, right, I, because there are, some, there are some stinkers, quote, unquote. But, you know, it's eh, there's there's likable parts about them all. Uh, but that is a discussion that we have often, and, and uh, that's a discussion I think uh, we should have on the show at some point. I think it would be a fun, fun talk to have that will take some uh, – a few iconic series that have like the most movie installments. And uh, we will think we'll, we'll do a ranking of what we think is the best series overall. If you take every movie in the series into account, you know, which has the least variance in quality and, and, and enjoyment. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be down for that. Um, I, I already have a few in mind, so. <laughs> yeah, I already, I'm, I already have a pretty definitive answer in the top of my head of, of what I like. And it, it depends. It depends on where we cut off the number of movies too. Yeah. So, absolutely. but that's a, that, that's a future discussion. Yeah. Something for the new year, something to keep on mind. Very good. All right. And, uh, keep it on the Halloween train. Uh, you know, like we said, we, we've talked about these movies before, but, and I won't dwell on it too much, I guess, but October 22nd, 1982, Halloween three, the season of the witch, um, a very underrated entry into the Halloween franchise. Nothing to do with Michael Myers. It was, you know, Carpenter's original, um, his original thought process, what he wanted to do originally, which was an anthology. And um, it's very good. It's very good. It's also very often overlooked. Yeah. And uh, anybody that knows me knows my thoughts on this film. Anybody that's listening to this podcast knows my thoughts on this film. I'm not going to repeat any of them right now because, again, we're talking about this franchise next week, next episode. Uh, so I will I'll give all my opinions next week. We'll just hold up to that. There you go. Have a happy Halloween. Love that song. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> October 25th, 1978, we, of course, have the original Halloween, uh, John Carpenter's masterpiece. Um, like we said, we you we all, you all know that we both love Halloween at this point. We've talked about it in the last two here. And we both know we love the original Halloween. It's great. And we're going to talk about it more next week. But there you go. Yeah. That's that's also yeah. an anniversary. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's again the 45th anniversary. All right, this is a big year—45 years since the first one. And this yeah. is the reason that next week we're doing the franchise episode because uh, our next episode after this one drops on the 26th, the day after this anniversary. So that's why we're doing the franchise, right? The, to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the original film, uh, we're going to discuss the entire franchise. Very, very cool. It'll be a good time. Uh, so don't miss out on next episode. I we I always like doing our franchise reviews. Um, they mm-hmm. get they can get a little fun, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. All right, so we have some upcoming releases. Uh, we have Cobweb coming to Hulu on October 20th, this Friday. Uh, we've reviewed Cobweb before, so if you want to check out our review, check out that episode. We both liked it for the most part, um, 
and now it will be for everyone's viewing pleasure on Hulu. Yep, yep. I don't, I don't remember much about the review. <laughs> I watched so much since then. It's like I was sitting there trying to cobweb. What was? Yeah, I remember bits and pieces, but I'd have to have a. I can't speak much of it. I can't remember a whole lot about it right now, off the top of my head. <laughs> no, that's quite all I'll right. Have, I, I'll have to watch it on Hulu on October twentieth. There you go. All right. And then Saw X is coming out on video on demand on October 20th as well and will release on physical media November 21st. Um, again, we recently reviewed Saw X. We both really enjoyed Saw X. We both really enjoy Saw. So we're going to obviously encourage you to watch this movie. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, this is one of those deals where it comes to, you know, the video on demand, but it's at a little bit of higher price point that, uh, you know, video at home or theater at home thing. So but it's that it'll be out there. For people that don't want to, you know, don't or can't go to the theater or whatever case, uh, there you go. And don't want to wait any longer. Uh, it'll be there on the 20th. There you go. And last but certainly not least, we have a Shudder movie. Shudder is just bleeding movies this month. It is hemorrhaging titles. Um, we have Night of the Hunted. It comes to Shudder on October 20th. And it is described as an unsuspe- unex- unsuspecting, good lord, Woman stops at a remote gas station in the dead of night, and she's made the plaything of a sociopath sniper. I'm assuming that's a sniper. That's a sniper, yeah. Okay, with a secret vendetta. So, um, you know, it, it's not often that we get movies kind of in this in this vein, um, you know, like gunman movies. I, I think that it, it's probably mostly to do with, you know, the, the very real threat <laughs> of a sniper in real life. Yeah. Um, kind of deters people from making movies about it, but I, I do see the potential this movie does bring. Um, so I probably will check it out. You know, I, I like all these Shutter movies, so but yeah. <laughs> yep, me too. I'll watch it. Uh, you know, Shutter. I, I watch a lot of stuff on Shutter, just not even knowing a lot about it. Because I just I have I have faith in them that much and what they're putting out there. That and Screen Box, both of them. They're you know I have a lot, a lot of faith in the the movies they're putting out. Uh, you know, whether it be an old, you know, even an older movie they're bringing on or whatever. And I'll, I'll scroll through and just pick something really kind of sight unseen. Just, I have that much faith in, in what they're putting out there. And, and I'm very rarely disappointed. Same, same. shutter has got some gems. But that being said, that wraps up our news, anniversaries, birthdays, and releases. That was a lot of stuff to digest. So if you would like, we can give it to you in smaller bits. All you have to do is follow us on social media. That's right. You want these in little bite-sized pieces when they come up? Follow us on social media. We'll get a sent out to you lickety split. Um, maybe not lickety split. This isn't a two to go order, but you know it is what it is. Uh, follow us on social media. That's all I gotta say. That's right. We're like we're like the caring parents that you know cut up your food. We'll do everything, but uh, you know bring bring the spoon home via the choo choo for you. All you gotta do is <laughs> if you don't want the whole plate full, hey, we'll we have it in bite-sized segments as well. That's right. But well, hopefully, of- <laughs> hopefully people are doing both, right? I mean, yeah. they're, I mean, I guess they're listening to this, they're doing, yeah, whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, follow us and listen to our podcast. That's what we want. Do it uh, all. <laughs> Send us money. No. Oh, sorry. It, it's like that episode of uh, Family Guy where they're talking about subliminal messaging in the yeah. '80s when people yeah. are smoking. Smoke. <laughs> yeah. Like it, like they live. I was like, obey. That's, That's right. <laughs> oh Lord. Anyways. Uh, coming up next, we have our official review of the Straight to Streaming Pet Cemetery's Bloodlines. Stick around. Listen to Their Screams is now a Fangoria collaborator. Get 20% off your order at shop.fangoria.com by using the promo code listen to screams at checkout. That is listen to number two and screams. Or you can click the link in the show notes. All right, we're back here on Listen to Their Screams, and it is review time. And like I said, this episode, we are reviewing Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, which is out on uh, Paramount Plus right now. It is written by Lindsay Anderson Beer and Jeff Bueller, directed by Lindsay Anderson Beer, who uh, she's she's the proponent of Pet Cemetery now. She's she's the one that wanted to bring this back. She's wanting to push for more. Uh, she must be a I don't know. She must be a big Pet Cemetery fan, I guess. Uh, the movie is starring Jackson White, Natalie Allen Lind, Forrest Goodluck and David Duchovny. It was released October 6, 2023 on Paramount Plus, and the movie is a prequel to the 2019 Pet Cemetery remake. It is described as, in 1969, a young Judd Crandall and his childhood friends band together to confront an ancient evil that has gripped their hometown of Ludlow. Uh, the Pet Cemetery movies are all based 
on the 1983 Stephen King novel of the same name. And like I said earlier, there are discussions and interest in doing more Pet Cemetery films uh, after this one. Um, so, you know, this this movie came out uh, almost, you know, a couple weeks ago, pretty much. But we had, you know, so much stuff going on. We didn't get to get to it immediately. There's so much. There are bigger releases, let's to be frank, uh, theatrical releases that we had to cover. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no disrespect to Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, but it got shuffled. Uh, but, you know, I, I did want to, you know, I like I like Pet Cemetery, right? I, I love the original uh, and uh, the remakes. All right. It's not bad for a remake. And um, and, you know, so I, I was excited for this to come in, in, in theory, in context, because I thought, you know, a prequel will be cool. Right. We'll, we'll see some things. It'll it'll expand the universe. And it did that. It, I mean, it did. You know, in, in the I did watch the Pet Cemetery remake after watching this just so I could you know, kind of remind myself of what was in the remake. And, you know, there was a part in it where someone's looking at a newspaper clipping that talks about the uh, a Vietnam veteran body turns up missing, you know, that was in this movie, right, with David, the David Duchovny's character and his son. And um, so, you know, it there's direct links there. And, and so it did expand the universe somewhat. Yeah. But, uh, but the movie was okay, but I don't know that it expanded it much in a way that, I don't know, really added, added a whole lot to it. You know, I, I was hoping it would add some elements that maybe were, were kind of a twist that, you know, something different to, to mix it up a little, but it was kind of, I don't know. It was kind of, I think everything they told in this, we, 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 we pretty much got from the other movie. We just didn't necessarily see it, but it was, you know, alluded to enough that we knew it was just, I don't know. It was odd. Um, it wasn't, it was a little, little slow for me. Uh, it was well acted and well shot. And, and again, I, I like Pet Cemetery, the concept, and I love the original. And again, I do enjoy the remake. So, um, there's enough there that it was okay for me because again, I, I, I'm a fan of Stephen King stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean that every book or every short story that Stephen King puts out can be put out there and sorted out and divided and made into 13 movies. Some of it just needs to, Let's tell it and leave it alone, you know, then and, and go get another Stephen King book or story and, and do sometimes, um, you know, I, I, I hats off to him for trying to do something else. And um, and it's not that it completely failed. It was there. You know, it was OK, but it's just I don't think to me, there, I don't think there was enough here to hold my interest as much as the, the other movies, the, the, the old, the original or the remake. Uh, I just don't think there's enough story here because it. uh the, the, the whole storyline stuff to be kind of fell short from the others. It wasn't as, as gripping and enticing to me. And I, so I was hoping they would, like I said, would put a twist or put something in there that would, uh, that would catch me. And, and I just don't feel like they did. It just felt kind of, kind of ho hum and, and, I don't know, it, it drug along a little bit for me. Uh, I, Ike, what'd you think? Yeah. So, uh, you know, so here's the deal. When I started watching this movie, obviously I, I, kept in mind the remake of the Pet Cemetery movie. And I, I will say this before I get too started here. Um, I do agree with pretty much everything Dave said. You know, this movie, it wasn't really breaking any new ground. It was all kind of stuff that we already knew. Um, you know, the main kind of the protagonist, his name's Judd. Um, you know, he is the old man that's played by John Lithgow in the uh, remake. Um, so there is a very direct tie-in. Um, but there, there's a very... So I have a comment to make here in just a minute, but what I'm going to say is this. Um, basically, the whole movie is the premise around this uh, t- town of Ludlow sort of has um, this dark history with the Pet Cemetery. You know what I mean? It's been around for at least since like the 1800s when the, you know, the, colon- the colonists were here and shit like that. Um, so it has it's basically establishing that this is not a new thing, that this has been around for a, a long time. All right, cool. That makes sense. And it establishes all these characters. It establishes uh, that Judd character that is in the remake. Um, and it establishes all kind of like the founding families and everything else. So it, it does a good job of kind of establishing some of those background characters that you see in, even in later movies. And kind of like Dave said, it talks about, you know, some things that you maybe missed in the first movie that were just mentioned briefly. Um, now, here's my, my primary issue. This movie is centered around, you know, the Vietnam veteran uh, who 
dies and, you know, basically his body goes missing and all of a sudden he's alive again. Right. That's that's I think his name's Tommy uh, in the movie. Um, that's kind of the main premise is that he's brought back to life by the pet cemetery. He starts to become corrupted and he starts killing people. Um, he starts corrupting other people as well. And that's basically the premise of any pet cemetery movie. Now, before I get into my major critique of just like the two movies in general, uh, one of the things that I did like about this movie is that they very much, um, they, they showed more of like how these corrupted individuals that are affected by the pet cemetery act. You know what I mean? Um, you, you get some of that in the original movie with the, with the little boy. Um, and you get a little bit of it too in the newer remake too. It, but I feel like this one also kind of goes deep into sort of like the mythos where it's talking about how they can like basically read your mind. They kind of know everything about you. And also, um, the, the decaying flesh. That was, that's a very interesting point they put in. And the, the, uh, the visual effects were very cool with that. So, um, I like that. But here, here's my biggest gripe about this movie, right? So it establishes that the main character in this is Judd, who is the main character in the new Pet Cemetery movie. And he is very firmly of the belief that sometimes dead is better. He says it. He reinforces it. Why in the fl- flaming fuck did he let that guy bury his child in the Pet Cemetery? Why did he even tell him about the Pet Cemetery? If in this movie it is, it is clearly established that it, the Pet Cemetery does no good, the pet cemetery absolutely should not be trespassed upon. Like, and why? Why did this old motherfucker do that? I don't remember. I didn't watch the new movie. Is there a yeah. reason why? Well, yeah, he uh, and he talks about how he he buried his dog when he was younger, and it came back, and it was yeah a little out of control. But he but he said that his dog was already mean. It already was a little wild and he thought that was just why it was wilder he thought the cat the little girl's cat was so tame and nice that it wouldn't it wouldn't you know impact it the same and he he, i think he was so adored the little girl and was such you know had grown so close to her he couldn't stand the thought of her hurting because her cat was gone so he thought it'll be okay the cat the cat will be okay and the little girl you know won't hurt, you know, we'll have her cat back. Um, I mean, I guess obviously he didn't think it through the, oh, something will happen to one of the kids and he'll bury his, the kid in there. Um, he just, I think he just thought since this is a nicer animal, it will come out as a nicer comeback. And, uh, that's, that's what he thought because he thought he was doing, he thought he was doing something good for the little girl because he, he had grown so close to her. Right. Well, okay. So my only response to this is three words. Fuck them kids. All right. Here's the thing. Um, I, I don't care. I know. I, like, it, it, it is weird. Uh, it's weird the way they've done it for this, the prequel, to set to, to get to that now. Before it was okay. It kind of made sense, right? It, it, yeah. it, if you without this prequel, it wasn't that big a deal, right? I understand. Oh, he didn't want the little girl to hurt. He, he you know, maybe he wasn't as knowledgeable on on, on how bad this could be. Right. But if this has been around for all this time. And he had experienced it already, not just the dog, but in other things uh, happening in, in his friend or you know classmate or whatever. And, and what happened to him when, when he was buried and he was supposedly supposed to protect this area yeah. and this cemetery and, and, and not let it happen again. You would have thought, I don't I don't give a shit if it's a flea. Ain't nothing getting buried in that thing. It's well, just. We're just not going to do it again. We're not taking that chance again. And, uh, I don't well, know. And that yeah. was, that, that was my thought process. Cause I'm like, this movie, I mean, it could not make it any clearer that the pet cemetery needs to be a secret. The only people who need to know about the pet cemetery are the people who are trying to keep a secret. Like that's yeah. basically how this movie establishes at the end of the movie that that's the, I mean, all the people who knew about pet cemetery are dead except for Judd and Manny. Now, Manny, we don't see again. I, I, I have a feeling that he will come up in maybe a future movie, which I think would be cool. I, I think that if they kind of followed that track and maybe, um, maybe somehow the, the reach of the pet cemetery was expanded, you know, I feel like that could be cool. But, uh, but yeah, so in the new movie, we don't see Manny, we just see Judd. So I, maybe it's a continuity. I honestly, I think it's a continuity issue. I think that they put way too much importance on keeping the pet cemetery secret. 
for uh, Judd, who was very directly and very negatively impacted by the Pet Cemetery, is mm-hmm. his, his, his fucking dad died because of the Pet Cemetery. He was just like, yeah, okay, I'm going to let this random stranger who I have no idea who he is, I'm going to tell him about it. And because here's the thing, it's a slippery slope. You tell him about it for the, the dog or the cat. And it's going to slippery slope into, well, my kid died, so I need to bury them in the pet cemetery. It's a slippery slope. That's what I'm telling you. Um, it's which, just, yeah. Which they had already <laughs> experienced. Exactly. That's my the, thing. The, the prequel established. <laughs> again, that's what I'm, you know, when you just take the, the original movie or the, the remake without this prequel, you don't have all that, the backstory to know what exactly. they've experienced. So you can think, okay, well, things have happened. And things are, you know, maybe not the greatest or weird and there's tales and stories. But Judd's like, well, I, you know, I had a, a mean dog that came back and he was still mean. <laughs> right. Okay, you know, eh, maybe maybe it was a dog. Maybe it was just the way the dog is. So it's not a big deal. Well, let's bury the cat, you know, make the little girl happy. But the fact that he saw, OK, let's see. Uh, this guy, you know, came back from Nam dead, got buried, came back and was killing people and was completely off his rocker. And this other these other people, blah, 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 all this and that. And what, you know, so he's already seen this. He knew, you know, so it's like he, he had to have known, even with it only being a cat, that it, yeah. it was going to come back wrong. So that, now, that's what so I was going to say. Brandon, he, did, <laughs> he did warn the dad when the kid died and he saw the dad. He's like, hey, I know what you're thinking. Don't do that. You don't want to do it right. You know, you saw the cat. You don't. You don't want. And I get that. But it's like. Why even dip your toe in with the cat? Why even why even tell this guy about? It? I mean, yeah, they knew it was there, but why tell them what it can do? You yes. know, why tell them it's something magical or something? You know, it, uh, I, it 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 whether you look at it if you walk at it now in the timeline, it uh, it, it makes in the the remake the, the the first movie it makes him look like an idiot in that now. Yeah, uh, because of this backstory, and uh, you know, and I know you can just. I guess you can cheap it out by saying, oh, it's all been all these years and he's an old man. And uh, OK, this is not supposed to be something so little that he's going to just kind of forget about. And uh, right. And that that was going to be my thing, too, is the only way I could see them potentially explaining this away is like either this guy like has dementia. But I mean, it's, it's very clear he does. And like, he, he's very cognizant of everything he's doing in the new movie. Um, very, very clear headed from what I can remember. Uh, I guess I'll have to rewatch the movie. I, I mean, because I really like the remake. I, I quite enjoyed it, actually, when I yeah. watched it the first time around. Uh, but I've only seen it the one time, so I really should have watched it before watching this one or after, you know, some some sequence of that, <laughs> of that order. Um, but I think the only thing I could think is, like, they do talk about how, like, the Pet cemetery like, affects you the longer you're, like, there, like, you hear it more and stuff. So, I mean, it, it could have been the Pet cemetery talking to him, I guess. I don't know. Um, but it, it's just like, like you say, it just it just feels very irresponsible for somebody who has all of the prerequisite knowledge that he has of how fucked up the pet cemetery is and how very, very wrong things can go if even the slightest mistake were to happen. And he still gives this information to somebody who he has no idea who this is. He doesn't know how this person handles anything. And the only other thing I could think is maybe he's trying to, like, pass the knowledge on. So he felt like it was required to like tell him about it, so that way he could keep it safe. But like even then, like it, it's just it just seems deeply irresponsible to tell somebody he's never met before about this very powerful magic land. I just I don't know. Given the information we have now, it just it makes it makes Judd look like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and uh, uh, the only other you know the only other thing I could say. Is it okay? Maybe you know. Does a cemetery have an influence, right? Does it yeah. have a power that would persuade him of uh, to do? But then you would think, okay, well, so if it has this power and it can do this, and it hasn't done it for all these years exactly. up till now. I mean, you know, I don't know. It just, especially since you know he already said his wife had died. So yeah. if it had this power and this pull on him, would it not have maybe tried to get him to bury his wife there, and uh, or whatever? I don't know. Or I don't know. I, I don't call. I don't know. Uh, it was. It's just odd. It it, it it felt to me like weak writing. Um, on the prequel, it, it's like uh, they they knew what they had to work with established, and it's like they knew what they wanted to do, 
And even though there was a point there that clashed with the other, they just they just went for it anyway to, and thought, oh, it's not that big a deal. You know, he's just doing it, because, whatever, whatever the reasoning is, or whether they even had a reasoning. And uh, they thought it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a, a, a clash. And it really is. It, uh, I mean, it's kind of like the biggest clash. I mean, it's, yeah, this is what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be protecting this cemetery, keeping it secret, protecting others from it. And, but, you know, and then he's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did your cat die? Okay. I'll break this rule that I've done for decades. Let's bury the cat. It just, it, it made him look like a putz. And, um, and, uh, and, the, and then, truth be told, the bottom line, even do, in doing that, they didn't get enough. There wasn't enough benefit on their part. It's no. not like they made this spectacular movie that you know, put a flaw on the other movie. But it's like, well, the, you know, you got a good movie. It's, it's still kind of a ho hum movie. That it's just, I don't know. It, I think it was kind of a, it was a weak, it was kind of a weak writing point there. And yeah. It, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it bothered me too. <laughs> I was literally, I was, I was lit, lit, like last night, I was literally laying in bed thinking about this. I was like, man, I was like, I, and I had to make my wife watch the movie because I'm going to talk to her about it later. Um, because now I'm going to have to rewatch Pet Cemetery just to confirm that I'm not completely off about all this. But it's like, it just, it just, it honestly, this movie makes the events of Pet Cemetery, one of the Pet Cemetery actual movie, just seem so absolutely unnecessarily reckless like just ridiculously so um it just it just seems like a very profound series of very wrong turns <laughs> it's just yeah it's almost comical and, and like and, you know and obviously i'm i'm definitely one to kind of just take the movie at face value like it's just a movie I, i'm not that worried about it but yeah it definitely had me thinking because when i watch movies especially movies where they do like prequels and stuff um, it, it, you have to be very careful with prequels because you can very, very, very easily with bad writing, you can very easily fuck up that movie and, and mess up how movies are perceived from that point forward. Um, and I think that's probably an, uh, an unexpected effect on this movie that kind of unimmersed me from the film is that I'm thinking to myself, all this horrible stuff happened, but then like he still did what he did in the next movie and it just doesn't, it doesn't track. So, you know, I, it, this movie will be losing points on the test because of that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I, I do agree. Um, yeah, it's like, yeah, you, you can get away with maybe, you know, fudging a few, uh, if there's a little something here and there, it's, it's not a big deal that you can just write off as the time or whatever. But when you're kind of taking one of the strong, backbone points of the the one of the main characters in the other movie and i don't know you can't really just i don't know you have to have a very clever workaround if you're going to try that and there was no workaround at all they just said oh well let's just do it and uh and and again it was uh yeah the the movie i I don't know i i hate to i hate to you know say but it's not like it was a well-written movie anyway it was just like i said it was just kind of kind of dull and kind of boring and uh it, it 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 felt like more like footage they cut out of the other film or whatever right at the beginning right it's like oh we don't need to tell all this we you know we you know we could do it in some remembering moments and and just mentioning and we could tell the same tale and it's just again i had hopes that it would throw something unique in there and add something to the lore that you know that would really give it purpose and um and i just don't felt i don't feel, i don't felt it did. i didn't feel it did so, and it, it, it kind of let me down. I, I, you know, I, I, I want a prequel or a sequel to tie to the other properly and respectfully, but yet I wanted to do something to make it stand on its own too. And, uh, this movie didn't do either really to me. It, uh, it, like we said, it, it created a flaw in the thinking, the connection between the other a little bit. And it didn't, I just don't think it had enough legs to stand on its own. So, um, so again, and I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm a Pet Cemetery fan, and it, it, it let me down. So, uh, I got are you, anything else you want to say? Or are you ready to rate this thing? Nope, well, I think I'm ready to rate it. All right, well, uh, I'll I'll go first again. Uh, for Pet Cemetery Bloodlines again, I, I have to give this thing a two out of five. Uh, I didn't, I didn't even necessarily, I didn't find it enough to to be what I would call enjoyable. It's like some of the franchises that that have so many sequels, and there's just one you get to, and you're like, yeah, I don't want to watch this one. 
I don't, I have no desire to watch this one again. Uh, it, it's, it's whatever. It's just nothing there. That's what this is. Um, I, it's, I don't foresee it being a movie that I would ever watch again. It just didn't have enough there to interest me. So for me, it's two out of five screams. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll give it as low as a two, but I, I am going to give it a two and a half screams out of five. Um, you know, to me, a three is a good movie. A two is a movie I didn't really care for. A two and a half is a movie that had some redeeming qualities, but it was not enough to make it enjoyable enough for me to give it a three. So two and a half out of five from me. Well, there you go. A cumulative, uh, what is that, a two and a quarter? Uh, yep. Two and a quarter, I guess. So slightly better than a two for us for uh, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. I just come on, guys. When you got a franchise that has some name value and you're on a, a strong network like Paramount Plus, come on, do do just do a little better. Right. Just put a little more effort into, into tightening up some of those holes and uh, knock yourself yeah. up a little bit. So Absolutely. Uh, again, I don't I mean, I don't there's not not that we can just sit here and just point out things to make this better. I just don't. I don't think there was, I don't know. I think you would have had to pretty much come up with this, a variation of the story to make it better. It needed something more. It just needed to be something more to it, uh, along with cleaning up some of what they had, if they're going to keep that, that as a basis. It just, it just needed something. Um, but, uh, that it, I don't know, it lacked for me. So, so there you have it. Uh, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, two and a quarter screams out of five for us. Uh, you know, so go out to Paramount Plus, watch it for yourself. Let us know what you think and give us some feedback on social media. Like we mentioned earlier, we're on all those platforms. So go and follow us and make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, like we've mentioned a few times next episode, we are doing our Halloween franchise episode. Uh, we are celebrating the 45th anniversary of the first movie being released on October 5th, 25th, 1978. And in doing so, we are going to do one of our franchise episodes where we're taking all the Halloween movies of the franchise and we are going to rank them uh, from one down on our favorites, what we enjoy the most uh, cumulatively, cumulatively between me and Ike. And then in the process, we'll discuss each movie uh, like we've done with other franchises. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I like doing these and Halloween is one that uh, I'm probably one of the ones I'm most excited to talk about because oh, yes. I, I really love the franchise. So, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm ready to to talk all things uh, Haddonfield and uh, related next week. So, Ike, before we close this out and get out of here, anything else you want to add? Um, I'm super excited to review Halloween next week. I'm also super excited to see uh, Five Nights at Freddy's next Friday. Yep. Um, I, I was just going to watch it on streaming, and I know we'll probably talk about it next week too. But I'm I am actually going to go to the theaters on Friday after I get off work. So. I'm pretty pumped. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably just catch it on streaming. Uh, but that, yeah, that uh, in Five Nights at Freddy will be coming up uh, as one of our reviews. Uh, that will be on the uh, episode the week after the the next one. So it'll be on our November second episode. Uh, we will review Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, it works out well for us. Like I said, we want to do the Halloween franchise episode, and then during the time period that that episode we record and release, Ike will be out of the country on a cruise. So the fact that there's a little bit of a gap there allows us to see the movie, go ahead and record the episode, have it ready to go so that we can still release it on time and still have a fairly relative, uh, relatively new movie in it. So it works out pretty well. And uh, then also in the course of all that on uh, Halloween day, we will release our special bonus episode that we release every Halloween holiday. I, all, everyone like the, the, the one we've had, you know, I, I act like we've been doing this for our whole lives. Uh, like we did last year, uh, and this Halloween special this year will be the Screams Family Halloween special. It will release on October 31st, Halloween, and it will be uh, it'll be full of all kinds of fun things. Uh, we suspect that Kayla and Monica will join us to help lead us in a trivia game uh, that will be a little more ramped up and a little more wide-ranging uh, than what we do here every few weeks. So it, it should be fun, should be entertaining. Uh, I may encourage all of us to be drinking while we do it just to make the giggles and fun be uh, e even more. Uh, but uh, it'll basically just be us having a good time and celebrating Halloween. So that's what you have to look forward to us in the next couple of weeks. So whew, that was a lot. And uh, we've we've kind of gone along with this episode. Kind of wild. I don't know <laughs> what 
I don't know what we got talking about so much that really got us uh, stretched out. Uh, but uh, but we did. Uh, oh, we we always did talk about the short. So we basically have the two reviews. So there you go. Whatever. It's OK. It's all fun. Hopefully you stuck with us through the entire thing. Uh, and then next week, like I said, the Halloween franchise episode. But until then, wherever you go and whatever you do, be good, be safe and have many pleasant nightmares.